my thought is that is that there's all these different streams in the sustainable ag community. There's the permaculturalists, there's the biodynamic people, there's the organic people, there's the IPMers, there's you know, there's all these different streams of thought and um, my you know, suggestion is that they each have pieces of the puzzle and none of them has the whole puzzle. And you know, conventional ag in all their biochemical analysis stuff, there's critically important pieces of information there. And my thought is that if we can integrate the wisdom from all the different communities um, into a, a matrix where they all fit um, and we can use empiricism to study what's true and what's not true, we can find out what works best and most appropriately. Um, I haven't gone into much of the you know, energetic side of things today. Um, I generally save that for tomorrow. Um, um, you know, I am personally of the opinion that most of reality is not on the physical plane. Anybody hear about this one? <laughs> <clears throat> Something like 95% of reality, according to the physicists, is not on the physical plane. A vast majority of reality cannot be found with any of our scientific tools. And so I think we should engage that. And I think, I think there's some pretty good hard Western science, which, you know, gives us some sort of guideposts about how we can engage that. And, um, and actually, I think our bodies are the most sophisticated tool for discernment we have. Um, so I'm going to go into all that tomorrow. And, and Steiner and biodynamics are on my agenda. Um, I wish I knew more about biodynamics and had been more engaged. I think <clears throat> I spent a summer in Siberia when I was 18 um, on a biodynamic, biodynamic farm. And that's like my most recent <laughs> experience with it. And it was more about learning Russian than it was about <laughs> learning <laughs> biodynamics. <laughs> I'm trying to say more, it snowed on the, sp on the summer, so summer uh, solstice. Oh. Yeah. And we were playing kickball out till like 11 o'clock at night because it was totally fine to see. <laughs> interesting, interesting. But that's, a, yeah. Um, yeah. I think there's a lot of wisdom there. And... Um, you know, as with many things, um, there are the dogmatists that sort of be all and end all. You know, this is the solution to the world's problems. And when you look at the results in the fields, there's leaving, there's something left to be desired. So, um, yeah, I don't presume to know the answer. I think there's something to it for sure. I think actually a big piece of it is the intention piece, um, which I'll talk about tomorrow. But, um, yeah, what was it? It was uh, Steiner's. Uh, Pfeiffer, Aaron Reed Pfeiffer, who, you know, uh, formerly is, you know, brought biodynamics to North America, um, asked Steiner when, um, <clears throat> at some point, I think it's, it's written down in, in the Ag Culture Lectures, he said, why is it when we sit down to meditate and we're able to get to a state of altered consciousness, um, why is it that we can't maintain that state when we get up to go about the rest of our lives? And has anybody else had this? Struggle? <laughs> Come on! I just like, ugh! Uh, Steiner said, because our food does not have enough soul force. Because your food does not have enough soul force. And I don't know what he meant by soul force, of course. Did he mean the minerals and the coherence and the vibration? Or did he mean the intention of the farmer? And, you know, like the... So there's something in there, which I'm planning on talking about tomorrow, that I think is extremely important. But the act of stirring and, you know, like you're putting, you're putting in, like you're putting some intention in. You can be if you follow the process well. How much of it is an inoculant, which I think it probably is a really good inoculant. The preparations. How much of it is mineral? How much of it is the vibration of the mineral, which can then be grounded? How much of it is intention? How can you actually monitor it all? How can you test it all? Um, bacterial and fungal dynamics. Um, uh, this is Elaine's work, I think. Uh, basically, uh, if you take, if you take a uh, a freshly laid down volcanic rock. Mount Olea just got done blowing her top, um, you know, six months ago. All the, all the lava has cooled. If you, you know, raw rock. If you were to do a microbial assay of who's living there, you would find a bacterially dominant ecosystem. You would find bacteria are dominant. Um, so the bacterial fungal is the, is the thing. It would be a million to one. If you came back a thousand years later or two thousand years later and it was a tropical jungle and you did an assay of the soil, 
it would be one to a million fungally dominant. Most of the plants that we call crops, most of the plants that you can buy in a seed catalog, prefer a soil that is somewhere in this one to one range. The more perennial they are, the more they like to go farther along here. Most of the things that we call weeds prefer a bacterially dominant ecosystem. When you have a, a, sub, a, you know, a, a material on the ground that is imbalanced, that it needs certain things, nature has a strategy for rebalancing that land and that is to grow the plants that are bioaccumulators of that element. Um, and so um, there's a book, I think it's, it used to be called Weeds and Weeds and How, Weeds and How They Grow um, by Jay McCammon um, that had laid out uh, all the common weeds, their Latin names and the specific mineral levels and ratios and other environmental conditions that correlated with their presence. So um, the idea here is that in many cases if dandelions are growing naturally or um, or dock is growing or nettles are growing or whatever, um, these are nature's cover crops. These are nature's way of rebalancing the soil. She knows which plants are bioaccumulators of which elements and plants those plants based on what she thinks needs to be growing in the soil. So um, one of my strategies for dealing with weeds is to understand that they're actually uh, polyculture cover crops and leave them alone. Um, like as far as I'm concerned, if there is a dock or a dandelion or something like that growing in my kale bed, there is absolutely no reason I should pull it out. If it gets to be four feet tall and it's shading out somebody, then I'll rip her head off and drop it on the ground and call it mulch. But in general, um, leaving as many different species of plants growing in close proximity as possible um, is, in my, in my mind, um, you know, good polyculture uh, practice. So, of course, they're actually nutritious. They're considered to be medicinal plants. Right, minor detail. Yeah, um, <laughs> you can dry them, you can turn them into teas, you can sell the tea for $34 a pound. Um, so basically my thought is that based on the environmental conditions, nature puts up, grows certain plants. And what happens when you till the soil, um, you know, after you have this mass die off of mi microbiology is that the bacteria are the first kingdom to rapidly reestablish. And so um, there are certain plants that flourish in a bacterially dominant ecosystem, and those are the, generally the broadleaf weeds, the pigweeds and lamb's quarters and gallon sogas and all those guys. They have a gut flora that is bacterially dominant, and so when nature has a strategy for keeping herself covered, right, growing plants, and so when the soil is disturbed and there's a certain microbial ecosystem, then she's got certain plants she works with to keep herself covered. Um, so if you understand these bacterial and fungal dynamics, um, you can manage your, manage, you can shift your management practices to change your weed pressure um, and basically create a reality where your crop plants are out competing. I'm not sure if I said that totally coherently, but I think I made the point. Um, this is sort of related, I think, but is, what do you, um, like invasive species, do you consider that in a different category than weeds? You know, because like around here we have this, um, multiflora that, you know, it just takes over all the woods and, yeah. you know, crowds out other things. Is, is that one of these, like, ways that nature is compensating or is it, is invasive species, I guess, a different category? I think that's my question. Invasive species are, in many cases, very powerful um, bioaccumulators. Um, and they're also, you know, things like poison ivy, as far as I'm concerned, you know, poison ivy grows in disturbed ground where nature says, get out of here leave me alone for a while. I'm taking care of some things. Um, when we bought our farm, it was at least a third, at least a third, probably more like a half, covered in multiflora rows. Um, I couldn't actually walk on most of the property. I could see it, I could see it, but I definitely couldn't get to a lot of the land. It was impassable. Um, <clears throat> and so one of the things I did early on was um, not only dig ponds with a mini excavator, but go in and, and like literally reach in with a with a claw and grab the multiflora roses up and pull them pull them up and shake them out and pile them up. That's how I cleared the fields. There was nothing else. <laughs> the thing that had to be cleared was a multiflora rose. And what I found underneath each plant was this rich dark soil, and what would otherwise be very you know tight, you know light colored, not very 
um, active, vibrant soil. So <clears throat> I don't know exactly what the case is. I just know that um, it seemed like they were building soil. They were saying, you know, get out of here. You screwed things up enough. Leave me alone. I'm taking care of it. It's a, you know, it's obviously not endemic. It's not, it's, it's not from here. I think um, kudzu is supposed to be extraordinarily nutritious, right? I mean, better quality fodder than orchard grass or alfalfa or whatever. Um, from a nutritional, nutritional standpoint, kudzu can, can grow and get minerals in a soil that other plants can't. So, um, you know, you could, you could consider it to be a, a very, um, you know, powerful and impressive ally. So does eventually, like, <coughs> nature rebalance and then these invasive species get held in check, or do you have to kind of trim them out after a while and then put yeah. something else in? If you had a um, old-growth forest, what's the likelihood that a multifloral rose would come in and take over? You're just going to guess it's probably low. If you, had, if you clear cut an old growth forest, the likelihood that multiflora rose would come in and take over is much higher. Yeah? Anybody heard of this thing they call um, antimicrobial soap? <laughs> at the doctor, at the hospital, you're supposed to clear cut the old growth forest <clears throat> of species to create an ecosystem where a pathogen is most likely to be able to establish. <laughs> Where does the staff get spread? Exactly. This whole germ theory thing is so ass backwards. It is so perverse. It is so, I mean, it, I mean, it is, it's, it's just 100%, 180 degrees off, right? We understand, I mean, it's, it's the, all the science is coming out about kids playing in the dirt and having dogs be the best thing for your immune system. The dogs that kiss you and lick your face and like cuddle with you, that's the best thing for your immune system. Um, so <clears throat> my guess is that these invasive species are, you know, coming in into disturbed environments that are really having a rough time and they're taking over, but they're actually holding space and allowing the bottom of the food chain to get established. And what was going on, at least where we have multiflora rose, was that, you know, after they've been established for 15 years, now there were some trees that were popping up through them. And that was going to be climaxing or, or, or tra transitioning over to probably a, <clears throat> a forest, which would have the multiflora be a much, much lower level, um, you know, not, not, so, not so dominant. Maybe it would still be present in a lower level, but not so dominant. Um, I don't know. I don't know. I think it's very intriguing. It passes the common sense test. Yeah, well, we make a lot of, it, of our decisions based on gut. Well, that's, uh, that's all these things I'm waiting for tomorrow to talk about, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to have to wait. Any question? So really quick, so I live in a very suburban environment where you have like these little patches of what might have once been forest left, yes. which are completely being taken over by wisteria. So I'm guessing that that just means the health of the forest is so poor that you kind of need it to run its course, to have this, the wisteria take over and then whatever I replaces it. It's a it's a, a, a uh, parasite vine. Yeah. <coughs> no. no, it's one's native, one's. Yeah. Well, I say parasitic is in like it leaches like energy from the tree. But. We've got. Um, What's it called? Bittersweet, which is a, a, a vine that comes in and takes over forests and things. We, we're going to talk tomorrow about, about teas and um, you know, things you can harvest from your landscape that will give your crops f energy. And a lot of these invasive plants actually have a lot of vigor and vitality. People buy liquid kelp from the ocean and the kelp forests are dying, as you may or may not know. Um, but there's no reason you can't make kudzu tea or maybe wisteria tea for your plants and feed them. Um, <clears throat> we've got this thing called uh, Japanese knotweed, which is a, you know, yeah. I mean, that thing has got some serious vigor. Mm -hmm. You cut that and you make tea out of it and you feed your plants and your plants are gonna be, <laughs> right? I mean, it's got tons of growth hormones in it. It's a wonderful, vigorous plant. So see those things as, you know, more vigorous than other things around and you can harvest the energy from them and, and give them to your crops. We'll talk about making teas and all that kind of stuff tomorrow in the in-season management piece of the puzzle. Everybody's heard about this uh, concept, Mother Earth? Heard about that one? Yeah. 
right? Close to Asheville, I figured at least a couple of you had heard of Mother Earth. So let's just say for a second that the Earth is your mother. Um, now, if someone was to, you know, take your mother and viciously or, you know, against her will at least, rip all of her clothes off, how would you feel? Just, you don't need to say out loud. There's some visceral, <laughs> there's some visceral. <laughs> <clears throat> and she tried to cover herself back up again, and they rip her clothes back off again. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that's basically what we're doing as farmers. You don't see bare earth in nature. She really is pretty clear about keeping herself covered. And we've got these management practices where we think it's appropriate to constantly disrobe her, to constantly uncover her. And she tries to cover herself back up again, and we go, no, 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 rip, rip them right back off again. Now, I think from a foundational standpoint, there's something perverse about this. Um, and I, I, I'm just going to say it's ignorance and like it's just the way things have been done for the last 10,000 years. And so that's what we've been taught. And we, for some reason, think bare earth is beautiful. Um, <clears throat> but I, you know, it looks like nature does these you know, different levels of plants. There's the, uh, you know, the base understory, and then there's the, this story, and there's multiple levels. And that's much more nuanced and sophisticated dynamic that we should be aiming towards. Um, you know, it's those weeds that are coming in to cover her when she's been so violently disrobed that we consider to be the pathogens that we're fighting. It was the disrobing of the earth, it was the uncovering of the earth, it was the killing off of the microbiology which created the environment for them to come in in the first place. If we can modulate our management practices so we don't engage in that initial violation, my understanding is, scientifically, you don't have the environment where the weeds have any power. If you can maintain that fungal dominance in the soil, that's the, uh, that's the environment where your crop plants will literally outcompete the weeds. This has been my experience on my farm, is if I manage my soil well, if I'm able to keep that fungal dominance, or at least a you know, one-to-one-ish bacterial to fungal dynamic, my crop plants literally outcompete the weeds. I made have mentioned before about if you're growing spinach, you want the spinach to outcompete the pigweed, right? Otherwise, you should be picking the pigweed to feed your to feed your customers. Pigweed will be more nutritious than your spinach if it's growing more vigorously. But if the spinach is growing more vigorously, it'll be more nutritious than the spinach. There's a major variation in these nutrient levels in these plants based on the environmental conditions. We can't just assume that they're all set and like this is it. They have everything to do with the environment that they're growing in. I think it's the right time to ask this question, but it always occurs to me when people um, talk about not burying the soil. You know, your small seeded annuals have to go in a bed of something. Yeah. Um, so I'm presuming that you're in some way burying some soil or some Absolutely. damp. Co okay, great. Just checking. I didn't know. So I've got, a, I've got a tractor, and I've got a rototiller in the back of the tractor, and I've got a walk behind rototiller, and um, if I'm planting small seeded annuals, I will till and I try to keep it about that deep. <clears throat> I figure if I've got, in some cases, if I've got the mulch that was there, I mean, I've had some beautiful transitions from, you know, tomatoes to salad greens where um, you just pull the mulch off mm -hmm. and you've got a beautiful, amazing bed that you can plant right into. Mm -hmm. Eggplants, peppers, a lot of things. Um, if you have a good mulch layer, if you're operating on that kind of a scale where mulch is part of your cycle, and you can just pull the mulch into the pathway, you don't need to do any disturbing of the soil. You've got an amazing seedbed right there to plant into. <clears throat> and you find you're getting enough sun down there to get those seeds to start out, and then when the tomatoes... Uh, usually, this is part of the process is killing the tomato plants, because it's the end of August, and cutting them off, the grass, cutting them off them the or yank them, depending, but generally just cut them. Yeah, um, yeah sometimes, depending on how they're doing, uh, eggplants and peppers. I did a lot of transition this past fall. I grow a lot of salad greens. I've got half an acre of hoop houses. And there's this window after which point if you have, you, know, you plant your salad greens when the frost comes and they don't get a chance to get established and you could have made $2,000 in that hoop house and you made nothing because you kept your eggplants for three extra weeks and got 300 bucks. So there's this, it's really difficult, but Sometime in the middle of September, it's like, okay, guys, you're the ones that are going to stay, and the rest of the year is going. <clears throat> and you just take them all out and get your greens in. And so, um, but yeah, even, or the ones that stayed got killed in the frost. And I come back in March and pull the hay back, and the soil is ready to plant in. Um, so, 
Um, but if I've got some grassy weeds or some low growing stuff or whatever, I'll come through with a tractor tiller and I just till inch, inch and a half, max two inches. That's enough to kill the plants and prepare a seed bed, but not to disturb the entire, you know, fungal ecosystem. So that's my compromise. Um, yeah, a critically important practical question. Yes. <clears throat> okay. Uh, biochar I wanted to talk about as well. Um, or somebody asked me about biochar. I think it's an important topic. People know what biochar is generally? Sort of? No? It wouldn't hurt to refresh. Um, uh, I think the big hullabaloo sort of fad thing started about 10 years ago when some anthropologists, I believe, or archaeologists in, um, in Brazil uh, were looking around in the Amazon and found these major areas with, with like, with a, it was a clear straight line barrier where the soil was dark and rich as opposed to the rest of the Amazon where it's all red like this stuff. It was like most of the Amazon is this red worn out laterite soils and there were these areas with like straight line boundaries that were dark. And like, huh, what's going on here? <clears throat> they didn't leave any buildings. They didn't leave any, you know, stone ruins. They just left soil. 500 years, it's still dark from what they did. It's a worthy question, what were they up to? And the upshot is they were doing slash and char instead of slash and burn. They were doing um, um, coppicing, you know, polyculture, permaculture, pretty sophisticated permaculture. Um, and when they were doing slash and char, they're making charcoal, they're basically put, taking that charcoal and putting it into the ground, which facilitated a much larger exchange capacity, which held more nutrients, kept which didn't otherwise leach, and those soils are much more rich and productive. Apparently like 10% of the Amazonian soil is this biochar. They did some serious work. I'm not sure like how far from the, from the river, but major, major amounts of land are actually this rich, dark uh, terra preta was, this, was, the, was, was soil. Um, so there's just been all this talk about, about biochar and how this is the silver bullet and a um, bunch of gadget heads have gotten all worked up about their machineries and their tools and they're like blowing off gases and running tractors and it's kind of cool, everything all considered. Um, but it is certainly a really valuable piece of the puzzle as far as I'm concerned. Um, one minor point, um, <clears throat> people, I think, who was it that went looking for El Dorado up the Amazon? Does anybody know there? Was it Cortez? I wasn't sure. I think it was Cortez, but I, I, um, we'll say it was Cortez, right? So he, he was on his way up the Amazon. Um, wait, we've heard about the Amazons, right? The Amazons are sort of Cortez mythical. What's that? Cortez conquered Mexico. Did he, did he go up the Amazon too? Or? No, sir. No, sir. Another guy. Another Vasco da Gama or uh, who knows what the... <laughs> Pizarro? It was Pizarro. <laughs> Some things are important and we all learn them and some things are not important and we all learn them and we proceed to forget them. Pizarro, we'll go with Pizarro. I don't really care who it was. That doesn't matter for the story. <clears throat> we'll blame Pizarro. <laughs> Get out your smartphone, somebody, and figure it out for us and then we'll, uh, yeah, <laughs> we'll know the answer. Um, anyway, first time they went up there, there was, you know, based on the original historical literature, something on the order of 100 million people living there. 100 million people, that's not a small number of people. Um, they spread the germs, uh, couldn't find El Dorado, came back five years later to try to find it again. At this point in time, there were 5 million people, right? Most of them dead. We, we know the story about how many people there used to be in the Americas and how many people there were shortly after white people came. Um, <clears throat> immediately thereafter, there was this thing that occurred in Europe called the Little Ice Age which has everything to do with the 95 million people in the Amazon dying off. They had such a vibrant biological ecosystem that they had been keeping in check with their um, coppicing strategies that when they all died, the trees all took off, sequestered so much carbon that there was a little ice age in Europe. Anybody ever heard about the little ice age? This is the cutting edge research data correlating what the cause was of the Little Ice Age. Look it up. Very, very, very interesting. For anybody who has questions about whether we can actually sequester carbon and reverse global warming, we do have a historical case of what actually transpired. Um, very interesting. Anyways, so uh, biochar I think is a wonderful material. 
um, if you've got your hands on it, I don't think it's worth the dollar a pound or whatever people are charging for it unless you don't have acreage. If you've got acreage, you need, you need a, a, you know, inexpensive way to manufacture it. But um, basically it has a wonderful um, poor structure, um, major exchange capacity. Um, generally the only, you know, caution about biochar is that it is basically a big empty tank when you make it. So the best thing to do with it is to take it in your compost pile or pee into a bucket full of it until you can smell your pee. Somehow you want to basically fill those pores with nutrients um, so that you're not putting an empty tank into your soil. If you put an empty, you know, extra two gallon tank into your soil, you're not helping anything out. But if you put two, two gallons of full of gas into your soil that's stable, that's wonderful. So it's got good pore space, it's good for microbial you know, ecosystems, you know, bacteria and fungi to reproduce. You till the soil and they've got their spot there where they're living and they can rapidly re reestablish this from um, a microbial reef uh, effect is part of you know, how it's described, biochar. So generally positive as far as I'm concerned. The question is how you're getting it and how much you're paying for it. Um, a lot of people pay a lot of money for things they shouldn't be paying so much money for and they don't, don't know any better. Um, but that's business, I guess. <clears throat> Does it also help feed the soil a lot because of the carbon base? The carbon is not particularly available. No, it's just a, it's a structure with bonding sites for, for that can hold nutrients and that can serve as a as a home for the microbes, okay. as I understand it. All right, so we were on seed, and I had gotten through most of the topic of seed, but I still had a couple things left I wanted to say. Uh, seedling vigor and culling. Um, I just I started this topic when I said uh, when you have your tomatoes. And they, um, uh, the, the ones that germinate first are the ones that have better vigor. Uh, I didn't go as far as saying you should really be sacrificing the ones that germinate last or giving them to your competitors in the community garden, um, <laughs> however you want to frame it. Um, um, but, you know, I can make this point most well by talking about SRI and SCI. People here heard of SRI? System of Rice Intensification. Uh, if anybody's looking for a, a really good news story, a really good global grassroots, this is the best global grassroots farmers movement story I know. Um, millions of farmers, dozens of countries, millions of hectares, um, Morocco to Malaysia, um, average increases in yield between 200 and 400 percent, um, creating the environment where, uh, you know, systemic misogyny is being reversed, um, reversing, um, you know, uh, starvation. Um, SRI is the story and you've never heard of it because there's no big foundations involved, there's no corporations involved, there's nobody with power who's got, uh, you know, skin in the game. This is strictly grassroots, word of mouth, you know, on the ground people. Um, it's a, an amazing story. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to spend at least a couple minutes on it. Um, started off SRI and has since been evolved to SCI, System of Crop Intensification. Um, the, I'm not sure if it's apocryphal is the right word, but the, you know, the creation story uh, is that there was a, um, a French Jesuit missionary in Madagascar who was at the end of his uh, seven year mission converting the savages and um, had a little chat with God and God said, you know, dude, you have been of no value to these people. Um, and he's like, maybe you're right. Maybe I haven't been of service. Maybe I haven't been of value to these people. Um, and so he um, decided to recommit himself to his mission uh, and start off by going and asking the people in the village where he'd been living um, what he could do to help. And they were like, you've been living here for seven years and you never, never asked us what you can do to help. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a great place to start a, start a relationship. Yeah, we have this minor issue, which is that, you know, during the dry period of the year, we don't have enough food and our children are starving. Um, if you could help us with that one, you know, we'd be happy to talk to you about Jesus. But right now we've got more important things to worry about. Um, and he's like, you know, that seems like a pretty legitimate point. Um, um, so he decided to go uh, on walkabout and traveled the island of Madagascar talking to farmers and seeing how things were done and seeing if he could, you know, tease out of the local wisdom <clears throat> some ways that the people in this village could have a more viable livelihood. Um, and after some touring, 
I came up with a few ideas, went back to his little hut, did some experimentation. A couple years later, came back to the people in his village and said, I think I've got something for you. Um, and um, and this, is what he, this is what he'd come up with. So this is what his, has sort of um, morphed into, or this, I think the basic essential principles he had uh, right. I don't know all the creation story, but, um, but the essence of SRI now is a couple of really, really simple things. So that's what I want to lay out. Um, the first one is in, you shouldn't flood the rice, um, which doesn't matter for most of us because most of us aren't growing rice and don't flood our crops. But the reason, just a little factoid, that rice is flooded is because rice is a functional anaerobe and um, can live in soil where there's no air when other plants can't. And so it's a lot easier to weed your rice by flooding it than by being out in the beating down sun weeding it. And so traditionally people would just flood the rice to keep from having to be out in the sun weeding. Um, but it does really have a negative effect on the yield. Um, that anaerobic environment, you know, inhibits root growth and everything else. So first thing, don't, don't flood the rice. Um, this is, a, I like to think of rice like, oh, every other crop in the world should be not flooded, but rice should be flooded. No. There's a reason why it's flooded, but it's not best for it. Every other crop in the world should have a 6.4 to 6.8 pH, except for blueberries, which should be four and a half or whatever. No. Blueberries can exist in a low pH environment when other plants can't. That does not mean it's their optimal environment. I can, you know, we can talk about blueberries later if you want, but there are some pretty good, you know, case studies of farmers who are dramatically increasing yields, getting better, you know, antioxidant readings, getting better pest and disease resistance on the same varieties in adjacent soils um, with a pH of 6.8 to 7.2 when their neighbors are at, you know, four and a half or five. So, um, you know, for whatever it's worth, um, I just want to lay that out there and you can pick it up later if you want. Um, basic insights behind SRI and SCI. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, traditionally, rice is planted in the sort of, um, they'll do three, two or three seedlings every four to six inches when they're transplanting. And they're going to be four to six weeks old. The difference with SRI is you do one seedling every foot, which is two weeks old. And that, on average, between doubles or in quadruples yield. So how the hell does that work? Pardon my French. What does that stand for? System of rice intensification, or system of crop intensification. The global record yield for rice production on a hectare, most kilograms on a hectare ever, was on our SRI plot. The global record for uh, potato production more kilograms produced on a, on a uh, hectare than ever before was on an SCI plot. The, we're getting global record yields through applying some of these ridiculous principles. Um, um, so I'm going to just walk you through this because it's, it's going to be pertinent to tomorrow's conversation and sort of um, foreshadow it. Um, and I think it's pertinent to a lot of things here. Um, <clears throat> I saw some, some, I think there were kale seedlings out there um, in the hoop house this morning. Um, that we're in this situation. But who here starts onions? Anybody start their own onion seeds? Yeah, when do you start them? Um, well, usually in January. <laughs> this year it was February. February. I'm in uh, Ohio and I start them in March. March. We're going to go with February just for local color okay, here. Like indoors. Yeah. Maybe in the greenhouse. February 1st, February 15th? 15th, let's say. Say February 15th. Okay. You do them cell trays? Yeah. All right. Right answer. February 15th, you've planted your onion seed in your little cell. Well, I put a lot of them in there. <laughs> <laughs> it gets better and better. <laughs> These are exactly the right answers. <laughs> exactly what I wanted out of you. Who wants to be an example? <laughs> me, me, me. <laughs> February 18th, got some little roots coming down. February 21st, maybe, little green shoots coming up. February 24th, a little more roots coming out. February 26th, a little more green on top. 
What's that? No, it's going to stop right here. <laughs> February 28th. Those onions have identified how much soil they have to build their bulbs for the rest of their lives. Anybody, you guys have pigweed down here? <clears throat> ever have a pigweed plant that germinates in the middle of May? Ever seen that, what that plant looks like in the end of August? You know those big, gorgeous, behemoth <laughs> pigweed plants? If only that was what I was trying to grow. You know those ones I'm talking about? Yeah. Ever had a pigweed plant that germinated in the middle of September? You're doing a fall planting of salad greens or something? By the middle of October, I'm not sure when your frost comes, you get this six inch tall pigweed plant that's gone to seed. Ever seen one of those? You've seen the six foot tall pigweeds that gone to seed and you've seen the six inch tall pigweed that gone to seed. Well, those are different variety of pigweed. Those are different environmental conditions. When the plant germinates, it reads its environment, reaches back into its 10,000 generations of genetic memory and determines how it should build its body in this incarnation based on the information it has available to it. So when it germinates in the middle of May and it says, ha ha ha, long days, warm nights, I'm going to go for it. When it germinates in the middle of September, it says, short days, cold nights, I better squeeze out some seeds before I get frosted. Right? The massive physiological difference in the development of that plant had almost nothing to do probably with the genetics and everything to do with the environmental conditions. This is the nature versus nurture conversation where everybody's always talking about nature and no one's talking about nurture. Apparently with corn, um, the plant on day seven determines how many ears it's gonna make. On day 14 determines how many rows are gonna be on each ear. And on day 28 determines how many kernels are gonna be on each row. The plant early in its life cycle reads its environment, determines what its likelihood, odds are, you know, best, best shot trajectory and modulates its growth pattern accordingly. So what happens when these onion seedlings reach the edge of their pot at age two weeks is they say, look, there's six of us in here. We got one cubic inch of soil to work with. None of us can have bulbs that are that big. And they begin to define downward their genetic potential at that point. Anybody ever grown broccoli? Broccoli that looked like it had you know, those good, beautiful plants and it grew and grew and it squeezed out a little four ounce head? Ever had that? All your broccoli plants come out these like little... <laughs> come on! I just... It's your fault. As soon as those roots reached an edge, they began defining downward their yield potential. Whenever you get a seedling that's got a bigger top than bottom, it's, it's entirely your fault. You have created an environment where that plant has defined downward. It's got a, actually, it's got a, a systemic hormonal imbalance now. You've set that up at age four, right? It is hormonally imbalanced for the rest of its life. Um, it's really quite exciting. So what happens here when these seedlings are grown out um, four to six weeks in a tight environment with not much space is they begin to define downward what they're going to do with themselves based on the fact that there's a lot of other of them close in close proximity. And so each one of these plants will send up one or two what they call tillers, which is basically the, the stem with grain on it. So you're going to get 25 to 50 tillers per cubic per square foot. Anybody ever seen tomato germinate in the garden and let it be and seen it in August? You might start your tomatoes in April or March or when you start your tomatoes. You put them in in April, May. When do you put your tomatoes in? May. Depending on your elevation, May. All right, good. So middle of May, you put your seedling tomato plants into the ground that you started in March or April. And a little volunteer tomato plant germinates. Seen those guys? Ever let them go? See those guys in the end of August? If you just don't do anything to them, they're 10 feet in each direction. There's green leaves from bottom to top. They're covered with fruit. See those plants? And what do your plants look like in the end of August that you started two months earlier? Six feet wide and covered with fruit. <laughs> Six feet wide and covered with fruit. That's better than some people's plants. I keep hearing about this 
what was it, late blight? Some of you have been getting late blight. <laughs> um, yeah, my experience is, I mean, my, how about, how about um, summer squash? Anybody ever planted summer squash seedlings out and um, not had enough seedlings to fill the bed and put seeds in the end of the bed? Anybody ever done that before? Three weeks later, who's bigger? The ones in the end. The ones in the end. At least catch up to and oftentimes surpass the ones you started in, in the seedling tray. When the plant root reaches an edge, it begins to define downward its yield potential at that point. So what happens with these guys right here? They reach out their roots. They don't find anybody. They say, oh, oh, oh. they reach out their roots some, some more. They say, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> they reach out their roots some more. And they're like, oh, 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 we're going to go for it. Yeah, that's exactly what they say. We're talking averages of 75 tillers per plant, you know, easily 50 tillers per plant. In some cases, 200, 250, 325 tillers per plant, stems with grain on it per plant. When all you did was put the seedlings in younger and farther apart. Average yield increase 200 to 400% global grassroots farmers movement so we've got you know women in india who are hearing about this through word of mouth they're practicing it on their land they're getting enough grain not only to feed their children but to have extra grain to sell and they're keeping it that money and they're taking their power they're reversing misogyny there are some amazing things going on globally because of some rudimentarily simple practices which have to do with this whole life cycle stage, in early childhood development, I call it, um, thing. So I've got it kind of here on the seed piece of the, of the agenda. I've got it on tomorrow morning's seedling um, piece. So we've, we've covered it today. We don't need to cover it tomorrow. Very, very interesting. Yes? How much for soil blocks? How about soil blocks? So soil blocks, I think, are your best strategy if you're not going to be doing big open trays. Um, so soil blocks would be a good way to, say, plant all your seeds see which ones germinate first, block them up immediately, chuck the rest. And if you can't bring yourself to put in two week old seedlings, block them up, block them up, block them up into the four inch blocks. And so, you know, um, get those ones that have the best potential, um, you know, as much space as possible. We're going to talk in a minute here about potting soil. And there's a whole other question there about what you're actually growing them into. Um, but yeah, that's the, that would be a, um, a good strategy, I think. When you had said potatoes, would that essentially mean that you would have more space in terms of the actual rows? So we had a, 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 um, a workshop at our conference this past year in December, um, but given by a guy named um, Mark Fulford, who's, I would say, probably one of the best farmers that I know of in New England, at least, uh, where he talks about potatoes and carrots and all these trials that he's done. So I would direct you to that. Um, I'm just saying you said... You had mentioned that, so in my mind, is that what you're referring to? I think you had said... Potatoes. I don't remember exactly what the details were. As I understand it, the global record for potato production was on an SCI for, plot. For me, the idea of intensification, like to, to do intensive planting, is actually to do a 3-2, a 3-2. A John Jevons, biointensive mini gardening style, yeah. like jack in as many plants as possible. Right. And so. you're, it just seems like, I mean, because you have, it, it's, it's one of those situations to where like, your overall yield, like your plants are smaller, but you're getting more yield. And then are you're you? also, yeah, absolutely. I mean, from... There's a, there's, a, there's a book called How to Grow World Record Tomatoes. Anybody seen that book? Whoa. How to Grow World Record Tomatoes. Okay, we got, a, we got a guy from Alabama or somewhere. He's a redneck country boy. He wants to be in the Guinness Book of World Records. And he says, he, you know, he spends five years trying to figure out how to do it. And um, his tomato plants are five feet apart. One plant every five feet. He's got four plants, 1,320 pounds of fruit between the four plants. A little over 300 pounds per plant. Guinness, you know, documented. It's a wonderful picture book because he takes the pictures of the whole process. He says, look, here's my seeds. I only take the fattest seeds. Chuck the rest. He takes a picture of his seedlings when he's about to put them in the ground. He's got this massive root ball and he takes all the leaves off the top. 
just the two newest baby leaves just about to come out are the only ones left. He basically rips the rest of the leaves off because he wants to get this hormonal imbalance going so that the roots are going to reach out like crazy. He does a lot of these practices, but what he does, I mean, 300 pounds of tomatoes per plant, for me, you know, I thought 50 was good, but I think 300. Um, but he was in Alabama and I'm in Massachusetts, so maybe that's, <laughs> um, I don't know. The cost benefit analysis of labor, of time. Um, I put my kale plants on three foot centers, three feet apart. When you're gonna have a kale leaf that's a foot and a half long, you know, from the center of the plant, that means you need to have three feet between the, when I go pick a bunch of kale, I just go like this, five, maximum six leaves pulled off the side of the plant, bunch it into the box it goes. This side of the plant, another bunch. My experience is if you give plants more space and do nothing more than give them more space, except maybe choose the most vigorous ones to start with, um, your labor goes down, your effort goes down, your yields go up. Um, I think I said this this morning, don't take my word for anything, right? If any of this sounds like it might remotely be possible, experiment in the corner and let the truth will out. If it's true, it'll spread. If it's true, it'll work. If it, it'll work, if it works, it'll spread. Um, I'm just conveying what I understand and what I've practiced and what I've found um, is that, um, yeah, so we can talk about it more. That's what I wanted to convey and I have literally half an hour left, so <clears throat> I'm gonna move on. That's okay with everybody. Um, I've read that the wider spacing a lot of requires less water as well. They have a larger root system to harvest the water. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't monitored anything, but um, experiment with, with wider spacing. I think it's a get the biggest, your, your most vigorous seedlings into the ground younger, give them more space. Just try this whole thing out. Look up SRI. If you haven't, if you need a good, you know, feel good story, um, look up SRI. Yeah. Would you mulch? That's exactly what I do. As soon as I put my plants in the ground, I mulch the living daylights out of them. If I've got uh, overwintered cover crops that I've knocked over, that might be my first layer of mulch. Um, if I, you know, winter killed cover crops that are laying over, that would be my first layer of mulch, but oftentimes I do um, gratuitously add more mulch. Yeah. This is for transplant spacing. Yeah. Yeah, and I do counterintuitive entire, entirely with my salad greens. I, I put my salad greens in real tight. I broadcast the seeds and they're not I mean, there's not much space at all between the plants. And I keep the conductivity up really high and I keep them cut back. So whenever they get, you know, they're starting to get out of balance hormonally, I cut them back so the, the roots are still dominant. We'll talk more about that in-season management stuff tomorrow. Uh, potting soil is my next topic here, uh, slide number 23 on the bottom of page four. Um, the topic in general uh, concept, if we understand the importance of early childhood development, we understand the importance of nutrition when, you know, humans are young, uh, the question here basically for you is, are your, your baby plants eating uh, macaroni and cheese between birth and kindergarten, or are they eating a balanced diet? Um, whatever's in your potting soil is basically what they're eating between birth and kindergarten, if you want to think about the time when you put the seedlings into the ground as kindergarten in the general life cycle of the plant. Um, um, so, anybody heard about this thing called sterile media? Yep. Sterile media means? We promise you, we've killed everything in here. <laughs> anybody who thinks that's something to be proud of is someone you shouldn't trust. Now, anybody who thinks that, that no life in soil is a positive thing is operating from a paradigm that is not biological. In many cases, the potting soils we have um, are you know, a, 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 a media to hold the roots up with these little salt fertilizer pellets, which is basically like you know, getting your babies you know, on the IV drip, addicted to the, you know, crack from birth. They're, they're, they're on the juice from birth. They're addicted to the salt fertilizers. This is exactly the opposite of what you want to be doing with your baby plants, right? Foundationally and totally opposite. Uh, my understanding is that between, you know, between germination and transplanting, in many cases, due to our various bad parenting skills, um, we, you know, cause at least half of the yield potential to be lost. We have so screwed up our babies by the time we put them in the ground that half of their yield potential, whatever was still left after the bad seed quality, is gone by before we put them into the ground. It's before the disease and everything else hits, right? Um, you know what the average yield potential is on corn? 
and versus what yield is in this country, just to ballparks, we know this one. If you talk to the corn geneticists, average yield potential in this country is between 1,000 and 1,200 bushels per acre. If you talk to the, you know, whoever monitors this stuff, the average yield in this country is about 160. So if you're doing some quick math, you'd say 12 to 15 percent of yield is realized. Anybody go to college? <laughs> if you got a final exam grade that was a 12, <laughs> you'd be a failure. That's the average yield. So there's some 15s and some 18s and there's some 4s and some 5s. Don't, I mean, this to me means there's an amazing opportunity for improvement. This to me means the bar is so embarrassingly low that you don't have to be very good at all to be twice as good as your neighbor. Which is about where I'd say I am on my farm. I might be at 30% of yield potential, but it looks like I'm doing an amazing job because that's twice as good as anybody else around me. Right? The opportunity here is massive because of all the perverse things that we're doing. So if we begin to identify the mistakes and the errors and begin to address them, the cumulative effect of those transitions begins to be quite impressive. So the potting soil, as far as I'm concerned, is um, what your babies are eating and you'd like them to have a really broad, you know, balanced diet from birth all the way up. Um, I generally recommend a compost-based potting soil. Um, I've tried, you know, digging out soil from the ground where the seeds germinate and do wonderfully and putting it in trays and I found that it doesn't behave like soil in trays. I don't know why it doesn't behave like soil, but it just... Something about not being in the earth yeah. screws it all up. Yeah. It is not in the earth and it just doesn't behave like soil. It just, yeah. I'd love to, I, I don't know the answer to this one, but I know, I just know that the answer <laughs> is that you can't, you can't take soil and put it in trays and expect it to behave like soil or pots or anything. Yeah. So I think generally the compost-based potting soils are a good place to start. I would prefer that much more over an inert media. Um, it's definitely over one that's got salt fertilizers in it. Um, the only thing I'd like to say, in addition to what may be available locally, I don't know what's available locally as far as your compost-based potting soils are concerned. Um, there are, you know, obviously the broader spectrum of trace elements are still important for biochemical, um, you know, function. So I've got, you know, I don't think I've got written down here. It says trace elements, um, but the copper and zinc and manganese and boron and cobalt and copper and things like that. Um, um, in general, your potting, your potting soils have um, high levels of NP and K, um, low levels of silica and calcium. In many cases, when the plant does not have an ex access to enough calcium, it'll put uh, potassium in the cell wall instead of calcium and then it's susceptible to damp damping off so I would you know really try to get some uh, calcium in there if possible maybe some silica um, I've got written down some things you could consider amending your compost based potting soil with here on the slide potting soil but as far as the quantities that you'd need to add um, <clears throat> without knowing what your what's in your potting soil I don't really have a ability to, to give you any kind of guidance sea salt's nice I wouldn't do too much of it um, I would do more, I would, you know, do a touch of the copper sulfate and zinc sulfate and manganese sulfate. Ideally, if you're making your own compost, you'd be putting these minerals into your compost pile before it's composted, and then they're going to be in that compost and you're going to be good to go. That's really the optimal dynamic is you are making this compost yourself, or you know somebody that is that's actually putting all this stuff into the compost at, before, before it cooks. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts for something just general like azomite? Because, uh, so Montmorillonite, it says here, is the family of clays that azomite is part of. Okay. Um, so yes, I would definitely do an azomite type material. That's going to give you broad spectrum trace elements. It's going to give you the silica. Um, I'm not sure it's going to give you enough of the calcium. So I've got lime and rock phosphate and gypsum are all calcium sources. Uh, ideally, you do not want to have too high of a number on the um, potting soil because the number means soluble. What you want is you want to have the plant you know, have those basic minerals present in rock form, ideally small particle sizes where the, it can learn to feed the soil life to access the minerals. Once it's been trained to do that, once it's been given that basic skill set from birth, it's going to be much more competent when you put it into the ground. If you start off your seedling with a soluble nutrient protocol and then you put it into the ground and say, figure it out, it's going to say, screw you. Like, come on, you are not helping me out in this process. Right? 
it's how you start the plant off as far as it's, how is it feeding itself? If you started off with an IV drip, you should feel a little bit of, a, you know, obliged to keep it on the IV drip. You really want to start them off from birth in this different sort of mode. I think I made that point. I'm seeing a few people's faces showing it. So one yes. that I helped out with, he had his whatever voodoo elements he had in the solution, and it was an Epsom salt, and he poured that into each of the dibble holes when we were planting. Mm -hmm. Epsom salts um, for Solanaceous family, peppers and eggplants and tomatoes and things like that. Yeah, so Epsom salt is magnesium sulfate. Uh, magnesium is the center of the um, uh, chlorophyll molecule. Uh, in many cases, we'll talk tomorrow about plant visual analysis and how you can look at the leaf and discern which minerals are, are imbalanced. Um, as we said before, it's when the plant makes sugar that it's able to feed the soil life. And in many cases, if magnesium is a deficiency, then you don't have enough chloroplasts, which means you can't make the sugar, which means you can't feed the soil life, which means the whole system is short-circuited. So uh, magnesium is a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, sulfur is also critical. In, in many cases, sulfur definitely is deficient. I'm not sure about magnesium in your local area, um, but it may not be available. So um, there's all, this, all these kinds of traditional wisdom about you know, take, you know, a few match heads and stick it in the hole of your pepper plant and Epsom salts in there and there's all these kind of little tricks and there's actually some pretty good biochemical rationales for doing that. Um, people have figured out, they've experimented, they have, but they haven't necessarily understood logically or rationally what it is. Um, anybody here um, know about the cooking, um, the thing that happens when you're like putting in basil or putting in salt and you sort of feel like, yep, that's enough? You know that sense? It's like a subtle sense that you feel. Some people know what I'm talking about, some people don't know what I'm talking about. Um, I would say most of the answers actually reside in that corner. Um, when you ask me specific questions about how many grams of copper per, you know, three cubic feet of potting soil, I'm going to be like, eh, I don't know. But I know that if I'm doing it, I'll just go, okay, that feels like enough. Um, there's, a scent, there's a subtle sense that I think we're all hardwired with, um, that in many cases we may have developed here or developed there or not even necessarily attended to. But, um, you know, a lot of the answers people try to get out of books or try to get out of other people. And I think everyone's soil is unique. And um, the real answer is what's true here, not what was true for you on your farm. Everything is different. It's not the same everywhere. And so um, I think that we're, I mean, we'll talk about the science about how this works tomorrow, but I think we're actually connected, vibrationally connected to what's going on. And if we can learn to attend to that, if we can learn to sense that range of frequency, um, it just really in facilitates the overall process. I think the green thumb um, is, you know, intention and attention. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else has had the experience of having a planting crew putting in seedlings. And um, I remember on my parents' farm where we would have, you know, various groups would come out from schools or from jails or whatever. And, you know, you could, they'd come out, we'd be, we'd be putting in brassicas, right? We got, the, you know, 25 beds of brassicas to put in. Um, everybody gets a row, go for it. And we, we'd come back three days later or a week later, it was like every fifth row, half the plants were dead. And it wasn't that they were put in necessarily poorly, but you know who that person was that had that attitude that wasn't attending to it. Let me know what I'm talking about. There's that whole side of things. So we'll go into that tomorrow. But how much, how much of what do you put into your potting soil? If you don't have that touch, I'm not sure I can really help you. It should be all together in the ballpark of maybe a half a cup per cubic foot of potting soil. Not a lot of minerals you need to systemically dose them. And most of it would be your clays and your limes and things like that. Not the trace elements, obviously. All right. Uh, tillage. I think I discussed tillage to some decent degree today. Um, I'm not sure if people have specific questions about it. I already got a couple questions. Um, we'll probably go into it a little bit more tomorrow morning and talk about preparing the beds. Yes. Half a cup of some total of all the minerals here in a cubic foot of potting soil. Not a lot to dose it su su sufficiently. You don't need a, you don't need a lot, um, but uh, my understanding is that is a weak point in many people's systems, is they have this NPK, whether it's organic compost or pellet fertilizer, um, but they don't really have the broader spectrum of elements present in that environment, which inhibits the enzymes in the biological system, et cetera.
Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Tillage, questions, comments? Nothing in particular. Um, Everybody pretty well understands that it's generally something you want to be trying to avoid or at least minimizing as much as possible. Do I need to give you some visceral metaphors to convey the point? We've had enough of those today. Does tillage make a bed more bacterial? Right? Generally, it'll make the soil more, more bacterial. First, it'll cause mass die off, and then the next, the first, you know, the reestablishment, the, re the, the group that reestablishes first is the bacteria. So if you want to convert your soil from fungally dominant to bacterially dominant, the best thing to do is to till it. And for the fungal and bacterial balance, do brassicas like bacterial somehow? Um, brassicas are the only family of crop plants that do not have a critical mycorrhizal symbiosis. They don't benefit. That's not true. It's not true that they don't benefit, just that they don't have a, it's not critical for them to. Um, my understanding is you can have mycorrhizally dominant soil that the brassicas are growing in, and they're benefiting from the presence of the mycorrhizae. Um, they just don't set up that relationship directly with them. Um, so they now have found that beets, the beet family does have a mycorrhizal relationship? I believe I always so. heard that it was brassicas and chenicillium. I think it's just brassicas. I'm not sure. Um, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. So like I said, don't take my word for anything. Um, I can tell you my experience is that my arugula outcompetes my weeds. And I'm pretty sure arugula is a brassica. Yeah, and brassicas, I don't doubt. And actually, I've heard that, but I've looked at um, lamb's quarters, which is Chenopodium beet family, and it looked to me like there were mycorrhizae on there. And yeah. so I've questioned it, but I keep seeing, Elaine says that, various people say that it's the beet and brassica family. So yeah. I'm surprised to hear that that's not what you're saying. That's all. Yeah. Um, all I know from my experience is across the board with all my crops, I try to create a minimally disturbed, if at all, mm -hmm. environment. And my experience has been in the past couple of years, especially that my crop plants are out competing my weeds, which is something that I never thought was possible. I, if somebody had said to me what I'm saying to you, I would have discounted it. Like I have too many decades of experience of weeds smothering crops to think that any other possibility exists. Um, so I don't expect you to believe me, but if and when it happens, <laughs> you can, I think it, he said that, didn't he? That's right, that's right. Yeah. <clears throat> Roots don't compete like foliage, right? What's that? Roots don't compete like foliage in the same way, do they? I don't know. I mean, yeah, yeah there's a, synergy, like. It depends entirely. The, some, some plants have a lillipathic, you know, exude a lillipathic compounds. Um, I don't know enough to know. Um, Depending on the planting? I mean, I'm generally engaging companion planting. Uh, generally, when I'm putting my kale plants in at three foot centers, there's a bunch of space in the middle of the bed. So I'll put beets in there in the springtime when I'm putting my kale in. And by the time the beets are picked, the kale's starting to you know, cover over. Um, when I'm planting my salad, I got my salad greens going in nicely. I'll pick them two or three or four times. I'll till up a little strip in the middle of the bed to put my tomatoes or peppers or eggplants in. I'll give them a good six inches or eight inches wide. And then I let the salad greens go to seed with, you know, as the understory beneath my tomato plants or my pepper plants. So, um, you know, I, I'm experimenting. I don't, I don't have a clear answer. Um, I, you know, sometimes things are a little bit too close. Like if I don't make a big enough hole for my, for my tomato plant and the salad greens have established a total massive, you know, dominance in that area, I feel like my tomato plants are held back by that. So. Like with SCI, like if they're just too close, do you think the roots could just stop them? Even though there's plenty of soil, they might think that they can't grow anymore? I think that they feel the presence of somebody else in close proximity and say, you know, rather than fighting, how about I'll take my space and you take your space? Unless they just want to share. I don't know. Anybody hear about plant whisperers? Anybody know anybody? Plant whisperers? In the olden days, there was sacred people who could talk to their plants, who plants, oh, not who could talk to their plants, who could hear the plants talking, right? You know about this one with the, the uh, anthropologists are down in the Amazon talking to the primitive, primitive tribal people, asking them, how could you possibly figure out that this root and this leaf could be used to address this ailment? Like, how did you do that? And they're like, 
plants told us, duh. <laughs> How else would you do it? <laughs> right? And the anthropologists are like, pet them on their primitive little silly heads and, you know, go back and they've got a story to tell, you know, when everybody comes back from, from you know, January term break from their, you know, travels. And they're having a couple beers and, you know, somebody who wasn't talking to the Aborigines in Australia said, huh, I was talking to the Aborigines and they said the same thing. Interesting. And someone from the next table over is like, I was working with the Maasai in Central Africa and they said the same thing. Huh. All these silly primitive little cultures. Arlo McClendick, Nobel Prize winning geneticist, said the same thing. So if you're a scientist and you've got 15 data points and 14 of them are on a line and one of them's an outlier, do you know what you do? You chuck the outlier. So we've got 15 different cultural perspectives and 14 of them say one thing and one of them says something different. Which one is probably wrong? 14. <laughs> 14, exactly. Right. There's, there's oftentimes at least one or two, if not more people in my workshops who, you know, think they're crazy because they're pretty sure they hear their plants talking to them. And I would say that's the person that everybody else should be really deferential to and see if you can con them into coming out to your farm to tell you <laughs> what the plants are saying. Those are the people who you really should be listening to, you really should be respecting and deferring to. There's this one woman, Moira, from Massachusetts, who was an early, you know, um, involved in all this stuff. And I remember she called me up a couple of years ago and she's like, Dan, I was just walking in the eggplants and they said they wanted lemonade. Why would they want lemonade? I'm like, Moira, it doesn't matter why they want lemonade. They said they want lemonade. Give them some lemonade. She said, well, what kind of lemonade? I'm like, what are you doing asking me? <laughs> Ask them what kind of lemonade. Why do they want, I don't know why they want lemonade, Moira, but they want lemonade. Give it to them. <laughs> Who knows what's going on? Yeah. What happened? Good things. <laughs> she couldn't get them to fruit and they, they, were, they were growing and growing and they weren't flowering. And she said, she was up there talking to them. And she said they want lemonade. Well, how, why could lemonade, you know, she wanted to know the logic for why lemonade would make them flower. I was like, I don't know why they would make them flower, but they, they, they told you they want lemonade. Give them lemonade. Anybody know about Bach fluorescences and homeopathy and, yeah. Yeah. you know, I mean, we have these tools in our toolboxes in many cases, if we understand, we've all got our strengths and our, our skill sets and they come from other, you know, realms of our experience. We can work with our plants in a much more sophisticated way than I think historically we have done. Uh, there's a really much more of an active communication um, ca capacity there. Um, I really am intending to talk about all this tomorrow, but it just keeps coming up, so it must be something to do with the audience. I'm not sure what it is. Perhaps his receptivity there. Um, anyway, yeah. So, um, top of page five here in our last 10 minutes. I think we can blow through these last couple slides. So, complexing of compounds. I think I referred to this this morning, but here it is written down in the text. Uh, there's an order of complexing of compounds from simple compounds to much more uh, sophisticated ones. Uh, the plant will start off with simple sugars, as we understand, made through um, uh, photosynthesis. Those sugars get uh, tied together um, with enzymes to build carbohydrates, which is the next level of complexity of compounds. Um, after carbohydrates are being built well, uh, the plant is able to complete uh, proteins by screwing together amino acids. Um, when that level of, of complexity is occurring well, the next level is the lipids and the fats and the oils. Um, and then finally, we've got the phytonutrients, the antioxidants, the terpenoids, the alkaloids, what's generally referred to as a plant's secondary metabolites, those things which correlate with flavor and aroma. Um, this is the order from very small, like 15 or 30 element chains to 15 or 30,000 element chains, right? There's an order of complexing of compounds. You need the small pieces to screw together before you can get to the big pieces. Um, and then the next slide here, 26, evolution of pest and disease resistance. Uh, when the plant is able to build complete carbohydrates out of simple sugars, it has resistance to what's referred to in, generally, in general as soil-borne pathogens. If you've heard of Fusarium or Alternaria or Pythium or um, um, what are some of the other ones? Um, Rhizocto Rhizoctonia, um, exactly. All those guys, those soil-borne pathogens are generally um, their digestive system function. Uh, they can eat simple sugars and nothing more. Um, these are endemic in the soil. They're basically present everywhere, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I understand. Um, and the question is only whether your plant is sufficiently healthy to be indigestible to them. 
uh, the next level of complexing of compounds, the proteins. Uh, when your plant is able to build complete proteins out of amino acids, it becomes indigestible to the larval forms of insects. All of them don't have livers, don't have the enzymes in their guts to digest complete protein. Very simple. Uh, cabbage looper, tomato hornworm, corn earworm, co Colorado potato beetle, et cetera, et cetera. Think about all your larvae. Um, generally, that's a symptom. Um, you know, sulfur might be your limiting factor. Um, it, you know, that's a critical piece in complexing of in complexing of protein. Who knows what it is, but that's the that's your you know your stage of of, of sophistication. These um, second two levels, the lipids and the phytoalexins. Um, if you don't have well-established fungal ecosystems in your soil, you're going to have a much harder time getting to this level of complexity. Um, really, the first two levels of, of resistance are fairly easy to get to. The second two, until you can maintain a good fungal ecosystem, uh, become quite difficult. Uh, when the lipids are built, built well, you have resistance to the mildews and blights, powdery mildew, downy mildew, uh, fire blight, late blight, etc., and the phytoalexins, uh, secondary metabolites, when you have crops that are actually very flavorful and aromatic is when you have the compounds that are indigestible for the beetles. So as I was saying before, I think I said it twice probably at least now, uh, there's a direct correlation between the complexity of the nutrition and flavor of the crop and the pest and disease resistance. Um, as far as I'm concerned, um, this is nature's report card. Uh, on my farm, I refuse to kill an insect or kill a disease. Um, a couple of years ago, I did have a tomato, a tomato plant in the middle of my hoop house that got late blight. Um, when people like yourselves who've taken my workshop and didn't believe me would come to my farm, which happens on a regular basis, and I'm touring them through the property and I'm showing them the hoop house, and they're like, oh, what's wrong with that tomato plant? I'm like, oh, it's got late blight. They're like, <laughs> 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 like, eh, what's, what's the problem? Like, you've got late blight, what are you gonna do about it? I'm like, I'm gonna let it sit there and watch it. A month later, the plant's dead. They're walking through the hoop house. They're like, oh, well, there's no tomato plant here. I'm like, oh, that one died from late blight. All the rest of the tomato plants are all, you know, the branches are intertwining and it's all the plant that was weak succumbed to disease and the other ones didn't. I don't know what the big deal is. This is not, a, this is, in other kingdoms, if this is animals, we understand this, right? Why is it a big deal with, insect, with, 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 with plants? I don't, I don't think it's a big deal. I think it's actually somewhere feels kind of true. Um, so anyway, um, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, last couple slides here are um, sort of suggestions for homework for, uh, as I said before, this course was designed to be given in the fall and then tomorrow's course in the spring. So these last couple slides are um, sort of suggestions for what you can work on over the winter. Um, uh, getting your fertigation and irrigation system in place. Um, make sure you've got the capacity to maintain hydration. Um, um, if you do have that capacity through an irrigation system, then you have the ability to feed your plants through that same system. Um, this is what I call cheating. Um, you know, rather than killing pests and diseases, I feed my plants. And I don't feed them soluble nutrients, I feed them microbiology and trace elements and, and things like that. Um, we'll go into that in some depth tomorrow. Um, but the idea here is that you have the capacity to maintain hydration systemically established at the beginning of the growing season. Um, my idea for what good moisture is, as I said before this morning, I think, to be able to stick your hand into the soil, pick up a handful of it, and actually feel moisture. You want it to hold together fairly well. You don't want it to be sticky. You don't want it to have too much water drop out, but you definitely want it to be able to hold together and you want to feel moisture. Foliar spring, um, you know, probably the best um, quick response thing you can do for your plants if you, you know, want them to respond well rapidly. Um, if, you're, if they're in rough shape and you really need them to turn around, um, I mean, spraying onto the foliage. For people who don't know what foliar spraying is, it's you know spraying things onto the foliage. We've talked a lot about the microbes in the soil and their critical symbiotic relationship with the plant. We haven't really talked about the microbes on the leaf surface. Imagine you've got microbes in your gut and you've got microbes on your on your skin. Um, uh, my understanding is um, that the plants don't take sugar and inject it into the soil only. They also take sugar and inject it through the leaf surface to feed the microbes on the leaf surface, um, who serve many purposes, many symbiotic beneficial purposes, among which is, you know, protecting the plant from pathogens. Um, they, uh, you know, pull nitrogen out of the atmosphere, do all kinds of exciting stuff. So when you're doing a foliar spray onto the leaf surface, you're, as I understand it, you're feeding the microbes, which are then digesting those elements and feeding them to the plant. So it's not just going into the stomata. They're actually being digested by the leaf surface people. Um, so anyway, 
having the capacity to do that uh, efficiently is, I think, very powerful. I, you know, as I was a younger farmer, uh, only ever had access to the classic solo pump action backpack sprayer, which um, I've always had something about, which is that I don't like them. I just really don't <laughs> like using them. And I'll get tennis elbow like four and a half minutes into using it. Like I can do all kinds of things. I can throw rocks. I can, you know, pound posts. I can haul logs. I can chop wood and nothing happens. But if I'm starting pumping that goddamn so solo sprayer, my, my elbow goes out and I'm like, <laughs> anyway, so I don't use one of those. Um, I use what's called a mist blower, um, which is basically a leaf blower with a tank on top. Everybody knows what a leaf blower is? A leaf blower with a tank on top. It's got four gallons. It's got a little tube that comes down and where the air would come out is where the water drips in. And I can be getting the back of this room from here. I can just, I'm sending out a 80 mile an hour wind with like a mist. And so I just go like this and I can do five beds at a time. And it, it's a dusk and it just sort of settles gently on the field. And I turn around and I can do five beds this way. What are you spraying? I'm going to talk about that tomorrow. All kinds of goodies. What's in there? You're going to tell. That's tomorrow. Tomorrow is in season monitoring and management. Tomorrow is all about what you, today was just background principles. Like, okay, basics of how things work. And then tomorrow's in the season. Now, how do we do it? So um, if you have a foliar sprayer, if you have the capacity to apply things to the foliage, um, it really can, you know, make it look like you're a much better farmer than you are, basically. Um, through feeding your plants on a regular basis, um, you can keep them healthy when otherwise they would be succumbing to infestation and disease. Um, so consider that as a possibility. Um, all right, homework, build permanent beds, mulch, apply minerals, establish cover crops, get your inoculants, do the best you can sourcing seed, improve your potting soil, get your fertigation and foliar infrastructure in place, and do some reading over the winter while it's cold and you've got nothing else going on. All right, that's it for now. Yes. <laughs>